Hi, I'm Tina from the Sayertown Area Library. You may or may not be able to get to the beach this year, but you can always imagine being at the beach with a good summer beach book, like the one I'm gonna read a little bit out of called um, Sunset Beach. And it's from a sassy writer uh, by Mary Kay Andrews. So sit back and enjoy our next episode of Remembering Books. Poppy's Tool Shed was a peaked roof wooden building he built in the side yard of the cottage. As far as she could tell, the shed was just as he'd left it. She pictured him there now, puttering away at the workbench that ran along the back of the shed. His bald head bent over his project, the transistor radio blaring his favorite talk show station. He'd be chewing one of his cigars. There goes a the tractor. <laughs> He'd be chewing one of the cigars Noni banned him from smoking in the house, humming as he worked or talking back to the radio host, dropping the occasional cuss word in Spanish. Everything was in order, although coated in dust, cobwebs, and what looked like an entire village of dead bugs. A pegboard held his saws, chisels, hammers, vices, and screwdrivers. He'd used old wooden cigar boxes with tiny knobs screwed to each to construct drawers for a homemade cubby holding a wide assortment of nail screws, bolts, and washers. The power tools were neatly arranged on the wooden shelves beneath the bench. An old nail barrel held scraps of lumber. She inhaled deeply. The shed smelled of cigar smoke, WD-40, and sawdust. It smelled like poppy. She gathered hammers, screwdrivers, pry bars, and a box cutter and loaded up the leather tool belt that hung from a nail near the door. Back in the house, she used the pry bar to remove a wooden broomstick that had been jammed inside the aluminum sliding door track in the living room. Where there she managed to shove the door open, allowing for a welcome rush of fresh air. She stood in the doorway, looking out past the now rotting deck toward the beach. It had gotten dark while she worked, but she could hear the waves lapping at the shore, and that was enough for now. She had work to do. She dragged a box fan in from the shed, set it up near the open front door, and got busy. For the next two hours, she pried and cut and cursed and sweated and ripped at the filthy carpet, bagging it up and ferrying it out to the trash in the wheelbarrow she found inside the shed. It was a clean sweep, she thought elately, sitting on an upended mop bucket to survey her work and eat her dinner. A convenience store sub sandwich, a bag of chips, and a quart of red Powerade. She swallowed three Advil and was considering her next move when her cell phone rang. She was surprised to notice the time. It was after 10 p.m. I thought you were coming by to get the key to the storage place, Bryce said. We just got back from dinner and the key's still here. I got busy ripping out all the old carpet and I lost track of t time, Drew said. Anyways, I can't put furniture in here until I get it cleaned. The house is like a toxic waste dump. Okay, well maybe tomorrow, Bryce said. Call me and let me know your plan. At midnight, she carried in her suitcase and a few boxes of the belongings she had brought from Fort Lauderdale and set them down in the clean but barren living room. She washed up, brushed her teeth, then went out to the living room and unearthed her sleeping bag from one of the boxes, unrolled it on the floor and in front of the open sliding glass door. Every bone in her body ached and the wooden floor beneath her was unforgiving. But she propped her head up on the pillow, improvised from a rolled up sweatshirt and sighed a deep sign of contentment. She closed her eyes and listened to the hypnotic whoosh of waves washing up on the beach. She was home. Now let me skip up just a few more pages. And she is, uh, have found something up in the attic of the cottage. The third crate had a label scrawled in Sherry's familiar handwriting. 
Bryce's crap. Drew laughed out loud. The box was full of books and papers, law books, loose leaf notebooks, and half a dozen composition books, all bearing the name Bryce Campbell on the inside covers. That's her dad. She rifled idly through the contents of the crate, stopping when she found a thick black binder. A typed adhesive label on the front had faded, but the type was still legible. Colleen Boardman Hicks, missing persons, 82076. This had to be the same missing local beauty whose disappearance had been chronicled in the old newspaper clippings. Drew Leaf through the three inch thick binder. There were page after page of type police reports, handwritten notes, and carbon copies of more reports. A pocket on the inside back cover of the binder held yellowing black and white photographs. She stared down at the binder. She knew virtually nothing about police procedures, but the book she was holding looked a lot like official police business. But what was it doing here in her grandparents' attic? When she heard a faint scrambling noise coming from the far end of the attic, she tucked the folder in the binder under her arm and scrambled down the ladder as fast as she could go. Downstairs, she typed Colleen Boardman Hicks in her phone search bar. The screen filled with dozens of citations. She clicked on the most recent article published six months earlier in the Tampa Bay Times. There goes that tractor again. <laughs> Um, 40 year old mystery remains unsolved. She skimmed the article, which confirmed that Colleen Hicks had never been found. Colleen Boardman Hicks was a vivacious blonde, 26 year old newlywed. She had a loving husband, successful career and strong local ties. Then one evening in 1976, after a day of shopping and dinner with a friend, she vanished seemingly into thin air. Now, more than 40 years later, officials say they are, they are no closer to solving the puzzle of the Bay's most enduring mystery than they were on the day she was discovered missing. In fact, Ralph Feiger, a now retired St. Petersburg police detective who was involved with the Colleen Hicks investigation in the late 70s, says the case has gotten murkier, murkier with the passing of time. For a while there, every five years or so, me or one of the other detectives would pick it up again, chase down some leads, talk to some potential witnesses, but we never really got anywhere. And then, not long after I retired, when I asked about the Hicks case file, a buddy of mine said it had gone missing, Flagger said. I couldn't believe it. Back then, we didn't have computers. All our work was typed or handwritten. The interviews, the evidence logs, the detective notes, all of that, years and years of investigative work was in that file. And it's gone, just as sure as Colleen Hicks is gone. Drew looked down at the dusty black binder sitting on the floor beside her. Was this the missing file? I hope I've piqued your interest in this book by Mary Kay Andrews, again called Sunset Beach. Um, and if you're interested, she um, also has a lot of other uh, really good beach books. So thank you for hanging with me for a little bit. And sorry about the tractor noise. Um, but you have a wonderful day. And we hope to see you soon. Stay healthy. Bye-bye.